so welcome, Jamie Lorimer. You've given us some amazing texts to think with here and texts that are sort of asking us to um, kind of reconfigure our logics of, of the pandemic, to not focus just on isolating pathology in an individual agent, but as you say in the preface to Probiotic Planet, to think about the intensities and accelerated connections of the globalized economy and the globalized food system that have played key roles in, in the pandemic outbreak. Um, the, the companion piece that you've given us goes really deep into some of the uh, theoretical literatures. And maybe by way of introduction, I'll just jump into one particular paragraph that I found really pithy and poignant. Um, picking up on that idea of intensities, um, you're, you're talking about it in relation to topology with Karen Barad and spatio-temporal -tempor relations. Um, to think about intensities of socio-ecological situations where bodies become ecologies entangled and unfolded within a geography of more than more or less pathogenic landscapes. And in dialogue with Hinchcliffe, you're talking about disease tipping points. So this particular paper is looking at absences. You're looking at presences, but um, you know, I think the poignant parts of the paper are about the about the ghosts and the mutualists that that get um, forgotten and conventional modernist epistemologies of, of Pastorian um, uh, biopolitics. And in this paragraph, you're also talking about um, socio-technical diseases that are enacted and distributed in these top topologies. You're talking about a, a, a word that I'm not familiar with, ecosyndemic um, uh, uh, situations where imminent political ecological situations where shifting microbiologies create conditions of dysbiosis. Um, and then picking up on the last sentence, and this is a theme that we've explored across a multi multiple meetings here, we're kind of on a, a process ontology kick and a whitehead kick. Um, and also, I guess, you know, John Dupre kick, you know, Hinchcliffe is at at Exeter and we've had a lot of Exeter alum kind of circle through here. So in this last sentence of that paragraph, um, you're talking about pathogenicity is best conceived as a process rather than a fixed object. So, so I wonder if, if um, you know, in starting the conversation, if, if you could just kind of unravel some of these, these ideas here um, to think about pathogenicity as process, the tipping points, and, and maybe if you could bring the two um, texts together, the probiotic planet, the, the prologue where you're, you know, engaging with this pandemic moment, and these, these other ideas about uh, topologies, interactions, intensities. Okay, thanks, Evan, and uh, many thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's great to, to join this group. I've, I've followed you from afar and not had uh, sufficient space to engage, so it's great to, to, to be here. Um, so yeah, there were two texts. Uh, the, the, the paper does actually follow in the book as a latter chapter in the book. Um, <clears throat> but just by way of context, the preface was written, uh, as I think I explained, sometime after the book manuscript was, was completed and written, written amidst um, the first wave, if you like, in, in the UK, and trying to see what um, the conceptual framework that was being developed in the book um, had to say about, about the pandemic. And it's fair to say, you know, the book was written uh, about a group of people more concerned with absences than excessive presences. So clearly the two are, are, are deeply entangled together. And the probiotic turn is uh, a group of scientists, citizens trying to reintroduce species to manipulate the dynamics of an ecosystem to revert it back to some desired stable state. So these are systems that have become pathogenic. They've tipped in some way across different scales. Uh, and the returning keystone species, be that the hookworm or the beaver or the wolf, is there to reset the intensities of the system so that they um, are restored to some desired form of circulation. Now, that need not necessarily be authentic to the past, but it has a set of functions and services that are delivered uh, that make it you know, more desirable. But the, the paper pops, pops up later in the book. I guess there's a sort of geographical warning <clears throat> against who see the, those who might see the probiotic turn as a simple technological solution to uh, the management of life. Um, and to try and open up the idea that uh, the ability to go probiotic, the ability to use these species to, to manipulate dynamics either within or without, 
uh, is very patchy in its geography. So there are parts of the world uh, in which it's uh, possible to have that degree of control. Um, but there are many parts of the world in which antibiotic approaches have yet to have the kind of benefits that we associate with them. Uh, and there are parts of the world which have both been subject to various antibiotic modes of managing life, but don't have the wherewithal to do the probiotic uh, shift back again. Um, <clears throat> so I guess it's trying to spatialize that uh, process model of pathogenicity to think about you know, where in the world these uh, relations might be bubbling up. Um, and one way of looking at it is a kind of classic Cartesian map of the world, you know, and it does, at least if we're thinking about things like hookworm, um, but it's probably true for you know, many other infectious diseases, it tracks very closely to uh, classic indicators of socioeconomic development. And there are the sort of hotspots in the, you know, in the south and there are the sort of relative absences in the north. But, but on a more, um, for me, interesting geographical resolution within nation state territories, there are clearly massive inequalities and massive differences around, uh, around cities. Uh, but even as we're seeing with the pandemic on much more intimate scales within urban neighborhoods between particular sites that become hotspots of infection and, and places nearby, at least in cities like London, which have you know, very stark inequalities in how people live their lives, um, that there's not a sort of simple ecological color it in in the geographer's kind of nice way of doing things, you know, that it's a much more folded, much more messy kind of topology. So, so the hope is that you could use the concept both to think about the haunting of species like wolves or beavers or hookworm that have configured dysbiotic relations, uh, but also, and this is an area that you know, much more work has been done on, to help it make sense of the excessive accumulation of viruses or microbes or, or even sort of invasive species, you know, plants and insects and, and mammals as well. So that's a rather long-winded introduction, Evan, but that's, I guess, where I'm, where I'm coming from. Thanks, Jamie. And, and if anyone is joining us for the first time, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask a question or, or type it in the chat. Um, and if anyone has a, a question right now, go for it. Or I'll push a little further <laughs> on, on <laughs> bless you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> bring, you're bringing your viruses to the conversation here. I like it. Yeah, all right. Good thing we're all socially distant. Um, just, just pushing a little further on, on the word intensity, something that, that appears in that quote that I read from the prologue and, and, and the, the paper, um, you know, there's obviously a, a big literature in affect theory to think about intensity, but as, as we're thinking about it in terms of these disease ecologies and dysbioses and tipping points, like how can you unravel that word a little bit and, and say, say a little bit more about the genealogies you, you're inheriting when, when you're using it? Yeah, so I guess, I mean, it, it, it comes directly from um, a conceptual framework developed by Steve Hinchcliffe and others, which is, a, I guess, a kind of Deleuzean whitehead model of disease causation. Um, but it seemed also to me to resonate with some kind of earlier work in medical anthropology, uh, this idea of syndemics, if you like. So diseases that emerge at the intersection of a range of uh, both social and ecological and economic factors. That it's not that you know it's not the single pathogen that pops up in particular times. Um, and that work has, if you like, a more kind of faithful commitment to some of the methods of epidemiology that you could you could you could map. You could um, try and disentangle the drivers of these diseases that would create these these hotspots. Um, so there's a there's a sort of scientific model that was faithful to what my varied respondents were telling me who might be immunologists as much as they are wildlife biologists uh, who are trying to talk about you know particular points where a range of processes that are both human and non-human coalesce um, <clears throat> i'm not sure the, if, the, if the term intensity would be familiar to mel singer and others who talk about you know syndemics but nonetheless the the, the, the premise that there are if you like, um, systems with multiple stable states and thresholds that can tip um, is, is common across these potentially quite different conceptual frameworks. So it seemed to me to be a useful um, term to capture quite a baggy range of concepts um, at that time. Um, I'm sure I'm sure there are creative ways you could make it speak to the work on affect um, and and a kind of, I guess, a more ecologized understanding of affect as bubbling up in particular multi-species configurations, um, particularly affect as sensed by non-human subjects as much as by the sort of emotional human subjects. Yeah. 
Great, thanks. And and while we're sticking with this paragraph, the ecosyndemic, if you could just un unravel that a little bit more, that's that's a totally unfamiliar term to me. Okay, so I'm I'm no expert in this field. I mean, I think it comes out of the sort of disease ecology tradition where you try and you know place the host uh, in its sort of social context, um, but it's I guess trying to also factor in the ecological context. So it's not just sort of host and social context. Uh, it sort of factors in the multi-species ecological relationship to it. So um, you have you can imagine a sort of triangle between you know human host, social context, ecological context, and they they work together. Um, yes, I'm sure uh, Fred or others probably know this literature better than I do in terms of the kind of disease ecology work and where the sort of uh, intellectual history of that concept comes from. It's, I mean, it's not, it doesn't seem a particularly widely trafficked idea, uh, but as a way of capturing, and also I guess trying to capture both uh, the non-human experience of these processes as much as the human experience of these processes, you know, that, that um, if we think through the lens of something like, you know, One Health or, or other, you know, synonyms, that, that the, the lived experience of intensive agricultural animals, you know, is something that we need to take into consideration as much as the lived experience of those working in the intensive animal industry, um, that there are these sort of shared uh, experiences across species boundaries where you could start to think of the, the non-human as a, as a subject of, of ill health as much as the kind of pathogenic object driving uh, ill health. Mm -hmm. um, just to think, you know, thinking with hookworms for a second, um, I mean, maybe just tell us more because I mean, I think you do such a great job in this paper of, of you know, talking about these, these ecosystems, both, you know, on the internet where people are starting to, you know, traffic in hookworms and quasi licit economies outside of clinical trials, but also, the uh, uh, you know you, you get you get uh, 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 very deep into you know like where where these things live and and sort of the messy mm -hmm. e ecologies. Um, could could you talk about hookworm health? Like, are, are, oh, and I'm gonna yeah, I mean, I could, I could I could talk a great length about hookworm. I you know it's become a sort of uh, mastermind specialist subject of mine, so, somewhat inadvertently. Um, so. I came to hookworm uh, as a as a subject of study, um, having long studied uh, rewilding in the microbiome. So you know, looking at people enthusiastic about wolves and beavers and cows and the like. Uh, and my you know my Google search alert started picking up uh, terms that I thought were only ever going to be used to describe beavers and worms. Sorry, beavers and uh, wolves being used to describe. Um, Organisms that lived in the human body, particularly this idea of rewilding or biome restoration, you know, was, that was starting to pop up. So I sort of immediately followed these leads, and um, and helminths uh, had been you know, quite prominent uh, in the history of disease control and eradication. You know, people wanted to, to get rid of them for good reason, and, and have done successfully in various parts of the world. Uh, but much of the knowledge of the consequences of their absence uh, was coming out. Of sort of subsequent epidemiological work, looking at well, you know we track this population, we get rid of their worms, and then these new diseases diseases come about. Um, and then I you know, started following the clinical trials uh, literature around those reintroducing worms, and and not very effectively, and and, and all sorts of. I'm, I'm reading your book at the moment, Evan. So I'm really thinking that you know these sort of comparisons, these sort of conspiracy theories that these things are being shut down by big pharma because they threaten um, the potential. Um, profit margins of drugs developed to treat chronic disease. So, so if, if hookworm is the answer to a whole range of, of infectious disease, of sort of um, autoimmune inflammatory diseases, and you get your worm, and then then you're you know you're you're cured if you like, then there's good reason why you might be uh, concerned if you were a shareholder in a large uh, drug manufacturer producing um, you know insulin or, or the like so so lots of kind of intrigue uh, and then this amazing world of people um, growing their own uh, for self-consumption but we're growing those to share with others on online um, uh, and very hospitable people I mean there's, there's one gatekeeper, gatekeeper in particular uh, who you know, spent much time with me and showed me his colony and showed me the techniques that he has for growing them at home and put me in touch with various uh, users um, and this, yeah. I, I mean, I, it's the first time I'd done any sort of social media ethnography, Facebook ethnography. So it was, a, you know, it was a fascinating world to venture into and to work out, I guess, how you 
corroborates or calibrates uh, the stories that have been told to you and, and how much it matters to have to sort of ground truth it, if you like. But, but um, um, and yeah, I was offered worms. I haven't, I haven't taken them. I was, I was tempted, but I, it was forbidden at home. Uh, my partner is not very keen on such things. So uh, I've sort of put the, put the responsibility for not having taken worms onto, onto her. But I, I have, I had various files that were sent to me in the post and you, know, you put them on and you know, they do their work, take up residence for a few months. Um, but I've, I've only got secondhand accounts of that. I haven't, I haven't done the uh, autoethnographic reworming experience as yet. So Roberta, I, I see that you've, some... you've got, uh, Roberta had her hand up first and then uh, was that Adam next? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Thanks for this interesting talk and uh, congratulations for your book. Uh, I was curious to know your opinion, if you have any, about uh, the role played by artificial intelligence and big data to understanding this uh, ecosystem. Thanks. Okay, Thank, thanks, Roberta, for your question. I think I got most of it. So the role played by artificial intelligence to understand the ecosystem. Was that right? Was that the, the final bit of the question? Yes. Yes, yes. As you might know, more and more increasingly big data and uh, artificial intelligence systems, softwares are used to connect and entangle different kinds of data to understand the complexity, for example, of the current pandemic. So uh, I, I would like to have your opinion about these tools and how they are doing these kinds of entanglements through space and through different kinds of data. Okay, um, thanks Roberta. My, my um, encounter with these technologies has been more amongst those who are, I guess, trying to model what happens if you were to restore a missing component of a ecology, um, perhaps to tackle an ecosystemic rather than to uh, discuss causation. So there's a whole world of um, ecological science based on topological network mapping. Um, and the science is based on trying to get as much data as possible about the different components that interact in an ecosystem um, so that you could uh, simulate what would happen if you brought back the species uh, and to sort of track as much as possible what would happen to the system as it, as it was restored. The, the sort of eco-modernist version of that um, is a piece by a guy called Earl Ellis, who's quite an influential uh, biogeographer who writes a lot about the Anthropocene and, and the consequences of human impacts on the Anthropocene. And he speculates about a sort of rewilding AI robot. Uh, if you could make the algorithm sufficiently autonomous and sophisticated, you could entrust it to do the rewilding for you in a sense that it would, in the kind of North American wilderness model, it would it would fully take the human out of the picture, you'd have this kind of autonomous robot AI rewilder that you could entrust with a piece of land. Uh, and in a way, whatever the robot did, as long as it was adhering to the principles of, of, of ecology, whatever they are, or at least as many of them, um, that it would, that would be a, a, a faithful way of, of enacting a restoration strategy. Um, now, it's a thought experiment, it's, it's some way off happening, but, but in some circles, there's a sense that this is a more robust, more objective way of of designing an ecological restoration strategy because it's done by the machine rather than done by the, 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 the particular human. So it's somewhat tangential to your question, but, but in some ways the same methodological principles are applying. Now, the reason that hadn't been done is because there's very little money in this space in contrast to, I guess, the spaces that you're talking about, which are increasingly well-resourced uh, to try and, try and do the explanation. Adam, go ahead. Thank you very much. Hi, Jamie. Great to hear from you. Um, so I'd like to return to the digital ethnography of the hookworm community, because I've been doing digital ethnography in the fecal matter transplant community and trying to look at those things, which, you know, of course, are very, very similar. So I was really interested in some of the nuances of your engagement with that community. For example, the like, how hidden is it? How gatekept is it? 
how is it articulated in the in the kind of I, I assume there exist forums or, or you know how, how underground is it essentially in in some ways and also uh, what are some of the the kind of common logics and tropes by which it is argued? What are the, the kind of underlying affects that go into both how people recount their experiences of, of, the, uh, of the, 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 the kind of hookworm insertions and also how they account for their, <clears throat> for their uh, experiences over time? Because it's one of the things I see a lot with, with the fecal transplant community is that there are these very detailed, uh, very, effective and bodily almost diaries in blog posts where people go through you know so day one or you know day 14 i had i passed this kind of stool or there's these very very rich detailed descriptions of the process of of how it affects the body so i was wondering if there are similar kind of accounts in the hookworm environment or if it's you know just what it looks like essentially Okay, thanks, Adam. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, the the principal platforms that I spent time on to understand this were uh, Facebook, where there are three or four different groups. Um, there's a, a wiki that's being created by one of the key figures, so a sort of you know a bit like a Wikipedia, but it's it's a sort of it's an owned domain for the helmet therapy, and then a, a suite of blogs that uh, are kept by individuals, which. To be honest, largely tailed off. There was a, a you know blogging enthusiasm. I got the sense in the, in the early days, and they sort of dissipated. And now people post mostly to to Facebook. Um, so there's, there's those are the platforms. In terms of the nature of the community, there are you know a relatively small number of gatekeepers who start these groups, who run these groups, um, and who have quite a lot of tensions between them. It's fair to say. So. Um, the early founders of helmet therapy went their separate ways for different ideological reasons. So some were much more driven towards commercializing the therapy. Others wanted it to be much more open source. Um, and they sort of wrestled control of these different groups off each other. And there were, I don't think there'd been sort of proper legal battles, but there's definitely been threats of who owns the platform, et cetera, et cetera. Um, much of what happens on those groups are um, providing advice and support to people who've heard about it and they go online and they find out, you know, what is it? And they want a guide. And that's what the wiki's up for. They say, go read this and then they come back. Um, it seems to play, a, you know, a sort of uh, as much a kind of emotional role as it does a um, therapeutic provision role. So people will, you know, discuss a wide range of things relating to their health, not just, um, you know, not just the worms themselves. Uh, and they'll talk about kind of key events within the scientific literature. So the, the, the group that I spend most time is very well versed in the science. You know, they they know the basics of immunology and they know, you know the basics of sort of uh, dietary dietary practice. And so so the level of discussion was quite high. And there's actually quite a lot of people who are um, involved in in laboratory work there. Clearly, from what they're talking about, and they will. Um, you know, post places you can buy cheap supplies on, uh, you know, the sort of, you know, from the, if you're an insider and you work in a lab, then you know there are some cheap ways of getting hold of things and that circulates. Um, and then this, the gold mine really was a collection of files on Facebook, which are people's um, hookworm cultivating protocols. <clears throat> so people put these up online and they're very elaborate, you know, 20, 25 page things. And they describe their whole DIY model of how they've gone about it, how they, you know, uh, incubate them, how they count them, how they inoculate, uh, with great pictures of all sorts of, you know, well, as you might imagine, being DIY biology, all sorts of creative ways in which they patch together, you know, stuff you use for keeping lizards warm, ice cream tubs, you know, which particular fecal matter they they think works best, how to make sure it doesn't smell too much if it's in your kitchen, you know, all of these sort of, you know, so yeah, it's a, it's a rich world, but it, it's um, those are the principal platforms. Um, and, it's, and, it, and I guess just finally, the, the whole commercial side of it is very much um, based on anonymous um, uh, email addresses and cryptocurrency. So that's the kind of model through which the retail happens to, to make it because it's not legal to, to sell these worms or at least to bring them across national borders into the, into the U.S. Definitely lots of uh, uh, correspondences with the CRISPR biohackers. Um, mm -hmm. Michelle, uh, do, do you wanna ar articulate a, a question or comment out of your um, chat uh, uh, comment about the probiotic other otherwise? Uh, yeah, thanks Evan. Uh, nice to be in touch, Jamie. I'm a geographer, but I was just saying I was more familiar with your animal atmosphere stuff. 
Uh, yeah, I, I just like the whole focus on probiotic out of, otherwise, particularly when you said, uh, when you talk about COVID as this sort of unruly ecologies and you talk about ecological dysbiosis and non-human vitality, because there's a bit of, you know, discussion on vital materialism. And so I wanted to know just in terms of COVID, uh, uh, given all this critique that you've mentioned, you know, scientism and quietism and hubris, I mean, how, how do you think about the probiotic otherwise in the context of COVID? I'm just, yeah, I don't know whether it it's, makes sense, this question, but I, I really like, because I do with the feminist, uh, I, I mean, I like the work of Catherine Yusuf and, you know, or, 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 and this whole idea of the becoming otherwise. So this probiotic otherwise really tracks me. <laughs> but like you Thank say, you. It's, not this, yeah. not, it's not this green probiotic dream that, you know, this romantic imaginary in a sense. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it, I, I, I want to just duck the question and say it's it's early days to know what a, what a meaningful probiotic take on COVID should be. But at the same time, I mean, I was re I, I had to do a review recently of a book by Julie Guthman, who is a um, geographer based on the west coast of the US, and she's written this great book about <clears throat> plant pathogens uh, called Wilted, and it's about the kind of emergence of plant pathogens from within the intensities of the Californian uh, vegetable growing system. Um, and I was reading your piece, Evan, that tries to kind of uh, open up discussion about the origins of uh, COVID and to sort of keep open the possibility that it has a connection to intensive animal agriculture as much as to the kind of, you know, the, the story that seems to be ascendant about, about wet markets. Um, and I guess to think through, and, and Julie try, starts to think about um, probiotic approaches to tackling agricultural disease emergence, the whole agroecology model, which has been around for, for longer. Uh, and she talks about some of the economic challenges of doing that in a Californian context where land is very much priced for you know high yield, high input models. Um, so yeah, so what so I guess what what would a probiotic approach suggest would be appropriate to do in in relation to the to the to the COVID vaccine? I mean, one can imagine a you know a fundamental reform of the food system, um, which had been proposed by some, you know, which would involve sort of you know deglobalizing. It would involve you know a much more robust set of uh, animal immunities within 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 ecologies um which you know some have been proposing in in the uk for other reasons but you know to do it on scale uh, in 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 the global context seems unfeasible at the moment in terms of you know, the cost of food let's say so so you know it, there's a sort of food system idea what seems to be emerging is is a certain sense that there is a microbial signature in the differential experience of COVID amongst different groups of people. Sort of, you know, they, they, we don't we don't necessarily know what what shapes the immune response. But we do know that microbes play a big role in in immune response uh, and particularly training the immune system over the life course. And so there may well be stories that come out that point to how um, you know, people's differential experience was you know, partly genetic on, on, on the human side and they found particular genes I think but, but perhaps more to do with life course diet health microbial exposure and so there could well be um, you know a kind of probiotic story there but it's probably likely to confirm what we already know you know it's, I don't think you need the microbes to tell you that you know poor people die earlier um, it just sort of corroborates that that story so I'm not sure there'll be a great reveal there um, other than to sort of continue to push for the types of you know, public health care that, 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 that people think are important. Frederick, do you, do you have time to ask your question before you go or should we just read it and uh, uh, talk about it in your absence? Okay, I can, I can read it um, very quickly written, but um, I, I was interested by the, the shift from the ecology of infectious diseases in the, night, in the 60s to uh, what you described today as the uh, probiotic ecology. And um, I wonder if it be, can be characterized by the shift from um, spillover events, um, which should be anticipated, to um, tipping points that can be reversed. And it seems that there's much more enthusiasm and, and optimism, I mean, in the, um, uh, the, this kind of probiotic approach than in the idea of preparing for disasters. Thanks, Frederick. It's, it's a great question. I mean, one of the things that's fascinated me in doing this work is the traffic of ecological metaphors and concepts across different scales. So, 
So for me, the idea of tipping points uh, comes much more from sort of climate science, earth system science, uh, or at least it's been given a lot of ascendancy uh, in the present to describe systems that have already tipped, have already transitioned into uh, a, a situation of dysbiosis. Um, um, you know, and what the story of probiotics gives is this kind of redemption narrative, this restoration narrative you can get, you can return or you can restore to some, you know, edemics may be too strong a way of putting it, but at least a kind of stable ecology. Um, I don't know enough about this, the, the disease ecology science in the history that you're talking about, but which was much more about a sort of coming disaster rather than a a disaster that's happened that can be reverted perhaps in the temporality of how the event is 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 described in in the way that the way that it's played out but um, it would be interesting to think with that a bit more there is a there is a sort of clear temporality in many of the accounts that, that i came across uh in which the the all-seeing probiotic scientist is is able to both diagnose the pathology of the past and then prescribe solutions for the future they sort of place themselves at a particular historical juncture which is perhaps specific to the to the contemporary present around the ways in which it's justified by this ecological story of thresholds and tipping points that could in some ways be uh, both known and reverted. I don't know if that would be the same for their equivalents in the 1960s, the sort of charismatic microbiologists or climate uh, or ecological figures, whether they had the same sense that this uh, the world could be conceived as such. I'm not sure. But I'll go and think about it a bit more. <laughs> And do you want to jump in with it with your question? Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you very much for these fascinating uh, readings, Jamie. I, I have uh, two questions. One is regarding uh, the introduction to your book, The Probiotic Pl uh, Planet, where on uh, page 15 you talk about the arts of noticing and you quote Stengers, Haraway, Singh and others. Uh, Haraway and Singh have used this guy in thinking to ground interdisciplinary research programs that fosters arts of living on a damaged uh, planet, the, the, the book, the edited volume uh, from 2017. And so I was wondering, can you talk a little bit more uh, what you mean by these arts uh, of noticing? I in, just recently, I read Eduardo Kohn's How Forests Think, and um, he, he, he talks about like uh, basically the icon index and symbols and the way in which non-human animals can read indexes and um, and icons, whereas the human uh, can also read the, the symbols, but he's uh, basically caught in this uh, semiotic loop uh, in, in trying, because he's also trying to conceptualize and understand this beyond the human, uh, but, but he's, he's, he's stuck in this semiotic process. So I was wondering, can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by practicing these arts of noticing? And then the second question is, um, in what way does the current coronavirus uh, bring forth a certain level of dysbiosis within the human body? Yes, so these would be my two questions. Fantastic, thank you. Great, great question. So, so I guess the first question um, was both for me a kind of methodological question. Um, who do I make alliances with to get to know better the ecosystems that I'm interested in studying? And then a, a broader epistemological question about you know, whose knowledge counts when we're thinking about um, you know, understanding the probiotic turn and, and how it works. And methodologically, I guess with many others on, on, on the group here, been interested in some time in, in multi-species approaches that would make alliances with science, particularly, I guess, um, animal behavior science, but also ecological science. Uh, and to think kind of critically, but, um, with a, with a sort of sense an alliance could be made with what one would get from those who are experts in knowing the field behaviors of beavers or knowing um, you know what what cattle do and and those you know people come in many shapes and sizes there are you know bona fide card carrying scientists but there are also at least in my encounter there are there are farmers there are hunters there are trappers there are all sorts of people who have local you know place-based knowledge uh, in which they've cultivated these arts of noticing that, that, that Anna Singh and others, others talk about. So, so it was having you know, quite a pluralist methodological toolkit available um, to see you know, what, what are the most appropriate uh, methodological practices for getting to know these, these subjects. Um, but I guess also thinking about what that means epistemologically for 
uh, how we know about surprising emergent phenomena. So many of these systems are non-analog uh, and they're quite hard to predict. Um, and have, but they have and sometimes, um, you know, and kind of asynchronous temporality. So you know, something will be happening somewhere else that's quite similar to, to here. And there are people who will know about these events because they've you know, undergone uh, an autoimmune disease event um, and they'll blog about it. Uh, and you know, some of the, 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 you know, the, the real figures of interest in my book are the scientists who hang out on social media, um, not because they're parasitical upon what these people are telling them, because they have to take faithfully, seriously, the experience of those who are undergoing therapeutics and, and are given sort of license to talk about them in that way. So, so some of the interesting conversations on the hookworm you know, social media space were between scientists either who had you know, disguised their identity for professional reasons or they were happy to be there you know, publicly um, trying to interpret and help people make sense of the data that they were describing of their own experience. And so there was a there was a, both a, a language that was found where they could have a conversation in common, uh, but also a sort of epistemic respect for the individual experience of one you know, person that might then help design future future trials. So, so yeah, so th those are some of the ways I've found the, the concept helpful, and it's taking you know some distance from Matsutake mushrooms, but I think the principles are still similar, if you like, about how we think about knowledge and how we think about method. I'm afraid I've completely forgotten your second question, so may maybe you could... Uh, you could you could ask it again. Yes. So thank you very much. Uh, and the uh, the other question would have been: In what way does SARS-CoV-2 bring forth a certain level of dysbiosis within the human body? Okay. So so I guess it 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 does that in two ways. So one, it it makes visible um, the uh, different ways in which you know. Well, I mean, I guess we could think about it both in the scale of the body and also the entanglement between the body and the, the wider environment. So you know, clearly viruses have been around, you know, for a long time, there's nothing, you know, un, uh, unusual, if you like, about this particular virus, but what's unusual is the speed at which it spreads and the way it's disrupted the everyday lives of, of people to, to such a degree. So, so it's, it's demonstrated a precarity that, that those of us, who live in the world sort of probably common on this call thought had gone away, you know, with the with the era of the antibiotics and the era of the control of infectious diseases, there was a sense that those unruly, unruly microbial non-humans had been put at bay. Um, and and now they're back, probably briefly, um, in, in a way that they, you know, they are commonplace to many people in other parts of the world. And you know, living with a virus is is not you know unusual for for many people in a way that it has become certainly for me, um, and so it's you know it's it's certainly for me and for for many others living you know places like Oxford, you know, revealed the kind of entanglement and precarity of our lives to faraway places, um, but I guess what it's also done is revealed, um, or it's it's made people think like a virus if you like it's made people have to think, on a very intimate scale about breathing as an act of citizenship about our porosity to the environment through through breath uh, and how you know how acts of breathing mediate our relationships to others around us and obviously made the mask this incredibly um medically significant but also culturally coded um device which you know anthropologists have written about this for, for, for some time but so it has it has for better or worse developed a kind of ecological sensibility or uh, at least a virological sensibility amongst people um, that it then gets coded in different ways. So there's a sense for some that becomes, you know, the premise for a, a kind of a much more mutualistic solidarity with others that you wear your mask because it's a way of showing you know, you're protecting yourself and protecting others. And then, you know, for those on the sort of libertarian side, it's a way of demonstrating your, um, you know, your your, li your freedom from the state. The state's not going to make you do this. But but suddenly the virus and thinking virologically has been given this very powerful valence that I suspect it, you know, it certainly didn't have in in parts of London. You know, where we'd cough and sneeze and you know, maybe you'd put your hand over your mouth but it wasn't it wasn't you know that wasn't something that the state had told you to do and therefore you wouldn't sneeze into your armpit now that's become so much more uh, fraught if you like as, as a mundane hygiene practice thank you daniel go ahead uh hi jamie thank you so much and congratulations on this fantastic book um it's really uh, a treat to read it um I, my question uh, concerns uh, possible resistance to the probiotic turn and 
how do you explain it? Um, I find it, for example, striking that both you and Julie Gustman and others have found so little alliances in the One Health approach. So it seems that at least in, in big ag and the science around it, um, there seems to be some type of, I don't know, it's, a, it's an active ignorance or active resistance to that. And I'm wondering how, what, what do you make of it? Um, is this really a, a emergence of doubt situation uh, where it's interest or is it really the basic science somehow contested where, there, where, where caution is at play in fully embracing the probiotic turn? Thanks, Daniel. It's, it's a great question. I mean, I, I guess I should uh, introduce a caveat that, that not many of the people who I interviewed describe themselves as probiotic scientists, if you like. So, so I'm always tempted to compare it to sustainability, you know, which was a sort of buzzword that came along in the 1980s, 1990s as a way of reorganizing human environment relationships. But there were a whole group of people who would self-describe themselves as involved in sustainable development. The only people who are really self-describing themselves as probiotic here are a group of, for me, some slightly charlatan figures selling you know, food supplements or, or you know, enhanced yogurt products. So, so the idea that, that there is a coherent probiotic term that could and should be countered by big agriculture or by big pharma um, is a slightly harder thing to, to diagnose, but I think it's still, it's still there. It's just much more spread across different, different policy domains. I, mean, I think I think we're doing some work at the moment on um, what's going on in the in the food system, and particularly the rise of what's become known as regenerative agriculture, uh, which has you know, precursors in agroecology. But this is seemingly becoming mainstreamed in in parts of the agricultural system that were often hard to reach. So suddenly farmers are now telling us that cows can save the planet. If you engineer their gut ecologies and you you know you feed them lemongrass and you um, you graze them in a certain way, um, and this for me is a sort of version of probiotic thinking, which has been co-opted into mainstream big big ag. Um, it, we may well see the same thing happening in the rise of kind of no-till systems um, in in the U.S. just because they enhance profit margins. Uh, in the U.K., we're going through a big reform to our agricultural laws and subsidies post Brexit. It. And within that, there's an awful lot of, you know, what would have seen quite wacky science being kind of mainstreamed in uh, at the moment. So I think in the agriculture world, there's not such a resistance to it, uh, maybe more so in the world of hygiene and um, disease control, um, in part because it's much harder to come up with an ecological measure of microbial presence and absence. So you know, doing work with the Food Standards Agency in the UK, um, who are in control of regulating restaurants and um, food, um, you know, food outlets. And all they have at the moment is a kind of quantitative test of microbial presence. And that's the kind of blunt tool that really, you know, inspectors have when they go into a restaurant. Like, are the bugs here or not? And if there are, well, you know, that's too bad. And you know, what, what they'd love, so at least those sort of more at the, the kind of enlightened end of it, is some way of revealing an ecology of microbes. Well, yeah, there's lots of microbes here, but it's fine. You know, there's a stable ecology of, of, you know, of, of life in the kitchen. It would be much better if you just kept this and didn't completely, you know, take it away because you, you know, create grounds for resistance. This is sort of the stuff that Heather Paxson writes about in her work on post-pasturian, you know, hygiene methods for, for for cheese regulation. And maybe that's coming. You know, there's lots of hopes. And uh, Ebert and I had an interview when you were in Oxford recently with the guy behind the uh, Oxford Nanopore company who wants to develop a, an iPhone-based sequencer that, in theory, the food standards inspector could take into the kitchen, and it would reveal on his phone, "Oh, look, yeah, this is ecology A, and this is fine. If you had ecology B, that would be wrong." But I still feel that's some way off. Um, so, at the moment, you know, for a range of reasons, it's easier just to maintain the antibiotic orthodoxy and say, "Look, you know, no germs is better than having some germs, and we don't quite know what they are, if you like." Um, and that's leaving aside, I suppose, you know, the, the themes we were talking about before about the sunk costs in drugs to treat chronic disease, uh, which you know, potentially the markets for which would potentially be undermined if you could reset gut ecologies. At the same time, there's lots of people speculating on coming up with the um, artificial version of the fecal microbiota transplants, what they're calling ecobiotics or the crapsule. You know, if you could take a, a functional gut ecology in a pill and it would take up residence. And, and if you had those 
it could be raised from laboratory strains of microbes that you could get patents around. I suspect that that's, that's some way off being feasible and might have all sorts of disastrous ecological consequences as we will standardize our gut ecology. So, so there's some really slipperiness about the kind of ecological nature of, of you know, the human microbiome. I suspect would always make it quite hard to reduce to the type of um, thing that the big pharma can, can sort of put value around. Adam probably knows more about this than I do. I don't, I don't know if the crapsules have figured in your uh, uh, in your world, or at least the sort of synthesized laboratory grown ones, rather than people, you know, stuffing feces into uh, more palatable delivery devices. So we say, I hope nobody's eating as we <laughs> as we're having this conversation. I thought I'd jump back in um, just on microbiopolitics. I, I think one of Paxson's key insights is that it's situational. It depends on you know situated affect and, and action. And circling back to something you were saying about 20 minutes ago, Jamie, about COVID and um, you know it immune responses perhaps reflecting prior exposures with others. Um, actually, the uh, immunological literature is is showing that. So. Um, I've seen some presentations um, showing that um, it's neutralizing antibodies to the surface proteins of other coronaviruses, like the common cold coronavirus, that might be giving many of us, um, you know, protection against the SARS-CoV-2. So, you know, we're, we don't, we're not walking around with antigens to spike, but we're walking around with, you know, broadly neutralizing um, you know, this is part part of the very complicated response of bodies. But I'm also, I, for some reason, I, I started thinking about um, in reading your paper and listening to this di dialogue, um, Stephen Jay Gould's idea of punctuated equilibrium, like as, as we're thinking about dysbiosis and in these situations, you know, li living through the common cold is not fun. I mean, I, I've been debilitated for, you know, weeks at a time in, in the recent past by the common cold. But um, if that produced some kind of you know, situational change in my immune system that's now suddenly adaptive, that's part of what Stephen Jay Gould was trying to get us to think about in evolutionary terms of you know, all of a sudden the stakes of the game shift radically, an environment shifts radically. You know, we can think about punctuated equilib equilibrium in these socio-technical ecological assemblages as well. So just mm. that's kind of my poached evolutionary theory thought of the day. I, mean, I think I think it's a great idea. I guess so much of this comes down to the phenomenology of human time in a way, doesn't it? <clears throat> Our experience of these things, for better or worse, uh, is configured around particular temporalities of, of, of our lived existence, which you know, vary by people, but have a sort of consistency to them. Um, and you know, the, the, the experience of the cold virus, one assumes, is, you know, is a fairly common experience in which there is a before and after, um, which is more difficult if you're thinking about I guess the temporalities that Stephen Jay Gould was interested in, which are you know far in extent of human time. Um, but when we come to think about you know, discussions about rewilding or ecological restoration, there is this idea of a baseline or some <clears throat> historical moment in the past that can be uh, referred to as, uh, as you know as either a desired archetype to which we might return, or at least a uh, a version of 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 equilibrium that that we could calibrate our models towards. And you know, there's very shifting baselines in Europe, you know, where 10,000 years ago, uh, it was under ice, which has tended to be the kind of start point, but we could go further back. And that's much more contested than I guess, you know, the temporalities of, of, of the cold, if you like, um, which, you know, most people live through in, in different ways. So I, so I think there's some very interesting conceptual work to be done thinking about the temporalities of, of, of uh, equilibrium and how they might configure <clears throat> ideas of the probiotic or kind of models of the probiotic um, and some sort of entangled politics that comes into that which, which is in one of the later chapters of the book about the way that the past is used to naturalize particular ideas of belonging particular ideas of who should be where when um, most commonly for you know big things in the landscape but you could imagine how ideas about the, the, the racialized microbiome or the primitive microbiome could also be set in different ways to shape ideas about who belongs where and where and when. If there's some idea of, you know, our evolutionary adapted environment, which is one of the slightly troublesome concepts that the immunologists will play with, uh, it often gets sort of coded into you know, particular sites and bodies in certain locations. Thanks. Ursula, you've got your, your hand up. <laughs> 
Yes. Also, many thanks for from my side, Jamie, for this fantastic new work. Um, I enjoy reading it myself a lot. So um, what I really like about it, that you bring in debates, you know, like your earlier work on wildlife ecologies and broader, you know, wildlife species ecologies, the, 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 the scaling, scaling down, right, the microbial. So I, I really like that, how you think about hyper keystone species, you know, in larger ecologies, but also in the gut biome. So that's fantastic. And my question goes into that direction, like, because I know in disease ecologists, there have been like after COVID, as you said before, many people have more ecological thinking, you know, it really helped us to think about large ecologies and connections between many species. So I know in disease ecology, there's been a long debate saying you need these large keystone species to actually control diseases, right? Because they are the ones who take out the sick animals. If you have, you know, um, foot and mouth disease, uh, a predator can easily detect the animals and kill them who have the virus, the bacteria and viruses. So do you see um, that coming up now? Have you followed the debates, you know, after COVID? Um, that this is so much needed? And, and is there again connection to the microbiome? So, so my question would be, how, how would you write your book in the post COVID world? Where the virus and you know, certain debates have really changed the way we think about these topics? It's a great question, Ursa, thank you. Um, I mean, I, I haven't immediately tracked a discourse that does that macro, micro, wild animal COVID thinking, but I, I could imagine a number of directions it would go in, most of which are pretty dark off the top of my head. Um, I mean, there's, there's definitely a story about the de-intensification of agriculture, if you like, that, you know, agricultural factory farms become the breeding grounds for these, uh, these viruses. I, I mean, I guess maybe the place to start is this distinction that microbiologists and immunologists make between two types of microbe, if you like, the old friend microbes, uh, and the crowd infections and the old friend microbes are those that organisms co-evolved with over time um, uh, and train the immune systems and the immune systems are prepared for uh, the presence of coexistence with such organisms and the helmets would be one of those. And then the crowd infections are those that build up in um, sites where people live in close concentration uh, in ways that were rare uh, or unprecedented in species past, let's say. And so the factory farm would be one of those. I guess the, you know, the urban would be another. And there's various points at which the fall happens in that sort of um, genealogy. Um, but if you've got these two categories of, of, of microbe, let's say, one would assume that you'd have to place COVID very much in the crowd in fact. Um, it requires, or at least the way that it's spread is because of the dense accumulations of bodies that enable you know, frequent um, passage through through breeding. If you were, uh, you know, if biopolitically, it's not easy to think about how you would, um, you know, palatably use the model that, you know, dense concentrations of, of bodies are more prone to viral outbreaks. Uh, and it's a natural phenomenon that lots of bodies die in a way that wouldn't naturalize a pretty bleak biopolitics of abandoning some at the expense of others. You know, this is the kind of COVID is guys revenge type story that you get in the sort of deep ecology uh, on the left that somehow it's punishment from some you know, being out there that will decimate human populations and reset us back on some sustainable path. Um, and you know, that model always tends to uh, implicate some uh, and and lead to some dying in much greater numbers than, than elsewhere. But so I don't know. I don't even want to create the possibility of that discourse existing. I'm sure it exists out there on the uh, on the Twitter sphere or, or or somewhere in social media. But but um, um, yes. Actually, I, I found a right wing uh, white nationalist group that had co opted the Extinction Rebellion brand early on in the pandemic to say, you know, this is this is. Uh, divine, divine Gaia sanction. Um, but we're we're getting to, to the end of, of our time together. Uh, thank, thanks again, Jamie, for offering this wonderful book. It's it's fabulous. It's perfect for the moment. And maybe just one final question. Um, you know, how how has the probiotic idea survived the pandemic? You you wrote your your preface in, in April when things were still getting figured out. 
Um, how, how do you see probiotic thinking now that we've kind of lived with these viral clouds for going on eight months now? Uh, I mean, facetiously, Magli's taken up uh, bread making, and I'm sort of swamped in uh, f fermented products in the house. So that's so that's all good, you know. <laughs> Lockdown has sort of, you know, in some circles, made people re-engage with all sorts of, you know, vernacular cooking practices, which might be encoded through the probiotic or not. I don't know. I mean, and, and again, you know, there's been a fair amount of writings about the anthropause, this idea that. You know, the, the lockdown, the sort of partial deglobalization of various systems has raised ecological sensibilities. Um, you know, the, I guess the coincidence of, of COVID and the shifting administration in the US and the possibility that climate change will become, you know, a, a proper political problem again, um, you know, maybe it will empower those kind of efforts to think systematically about tackling planetary dysbiosis and, and you know, and, and sort of ecological activities. So, there's a there's a coincidence of events that you know potentially if if I'm optimistic you know could allow us to do the great reset to build back better in in, in certain ways um, it's perhaps too early to tell I'd just would like to think so in the bleakness of the end of 2020 that you know by the end of next year um, we'll have meaningful progress on a range of um, you know at least on the kind of planetary scale. Uh, but potentially in a sort of more mundane way in terms of how people re-engage with the world after lockdown, start to sort of value the things that that, that they, you know, whether there'll be a sort of nostalgia for lockdown for the kind of, you know, the, the particular intimacies and modes of attention that we're all grinding through at the moment, but maybe, maybe that will be something we'd want to, to, to at least anticipate. I don't know. Indeed, yeah. I, I, you know, having spent some time in England, it, there is that nostalgia for war times. <laughs> you know, this could be the new, you know, 2020 nostalgia could could be what we all have going forward in some kind of weird way. Yeah. Um, but thank, it was thank always you better again, in the past. It was yeah. always better in the past in Britain, <laughs> even if. It, yeah. Great. Thank you thanks, very much. Thanks Kevin. again, Jamie. This this yeah. is a fabulous book. Um, be great to teach with. Um, we're we're going to be taking a break with with the the group over the holidays. We're going to start up mid January. Um, Wim Vanderpol is is coming up next. Um, he's he's a veterinary scientist who studies emergent veterinary viruses, foodborne viruses, zoonotic viruses, and One Health. Um, I've also just reached out to Steve Hincliffe to see if um, he'll share some of the papers that Jamie has cited in his piece. Um, today. And then we've also got Tom Van Doren um, uh, engaging with Debbie Berg Rose's work on, on bats. So this is the third bat event that we'll be doing. So thanks again, Jamie. Um, happy holidays, everyone. Um, I hope we all survive uh, for, for 2021. Ho hope to see you next year. Thanks, Evan. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jamie. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jamie.